morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Sunday School Hour. I'm Lori Denson bringing you greetings from the Burning Bush Church. And we have another magnificent, awesome lesson from the Lord. It um, has all the makings of a good movie. It deals with blended families. It deals with stepmamas. It deals with half brothers. It deals with jealousy, hatred, kidnapping, human trafficking, lying, cheating. <laughs> it deals with everything, <laughs> everything that we see on the movies today. And it just lets you know that um, I was really touched with blended family because Bishop and I have a blended family. And it just gave me the, um, the information that it started way back when. It wasn't something that we came up with. And so we're in Genesis. We're talking about Joseph. And uh, we're going to get with it. We're going to pray and get with it because it's a really good lesson. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, oh God, for what our, our hearts and our minds and our ears have heard through your word. We ask, oh God, that you allow only what to come out that you want to come out. We thank you for every person that is hearing this morning. We thank you for every person that will not only just be hearers of your word, Father, but doers of your word. We thank you for this story that parallels to so many of our lives today. We ask you to bless us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are coming, as I said, from the um, first book of the Bible, Genesis. And we're going to be reading from the 37th chapter. We have most of the 37th chapter. You should read the whole thing because it all ties in. Um, and as I said before, we're talking about Joseph. Now, Bishop has been preaching and teaching about Joseph, so you're going to see some, some commonalities between this Sunday school morning lesson and um, what he's been doing on Wednesdays. And so I just want to start off with jealousy, hate, and love are emotions that people experience in their families. We've all experienced it in our family. You're lying if you say you didn't. How do people deal with these emotions? An absence of love for Joseph by his brothers led to envy and finally a plot to kill him. And when I thought about Joseph, you know, we hear the good things about Joseph, about how he was a ruler and all of that. But this scripture, Joseph was just a teenager. He was just a teenager. He was a boy. And you know what boys do, just like, you know, we, they're immature. And so they talk a little too much. They're a little too cocky, a little too proud. So when I've heard the story, and I've read this story before in the past, I thought, oh, the brothers were so mean. How could they do that to Joseph? How could you treat your brother like that? That's so wrong. But then, you know, I, I have some sisters. I have one brother. I have some sisters. And, you know, sometimes they just know what to, to say or to do to push those buttons. And Joseph was no exception. So he knew what to say to push those buttons. Now remember, if you go back to Joseph's parents, you got Jacob and you got Rachel. There was some deception and some deviousness when they were coming up and when they first got together. So he got it honest. He got it honest. So let's go ahead and start out. Um, Genesis 37, let's start on the second verse. And it reads, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his, his father their evil report. Let's pause there for a minute. Now there goes Joseph snitching, tattletaling, always talking out of school. Now imagine this. You're 17, so you're one of the younger brothers. You're out there in the fields with your older brothers. And you know when your father's not around or the boss is not around, how you might mess around and play and things like that. But what did Joseph do? He ran back and told his daddy. So you know they got in trouble. That didn't help his case because they already didn't like him. You're going to find out. <laughs> and so him being a blabbermouth or a snitch is not going to help his case at all. Now, I said that this was a blended family, so you see he was here with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. So those, well, those were not his true brothers or his whole brothers. They were half-brothers because Zilhah and Bilhah were not his mothers. 
was, neither one of them was Joseph's mother. Okay? Third verse. Now Israel loved Joseph. Israel loved Joseph. Israel is the name of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So when you see that, just talking about his daddy loved him. Israel loved Joseph more than any of all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. I'm going to go ahead and read the fourth verse and then we'll, we'll pause. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, I tag this section, my favorite slash, the source of hate, because Joseph was Jacob's favorite, and Joseph was also the source of his brother's hate. Now, Jacob loved, remember the story, Jacob worked for Laban, which was uh, Rachel and Leah's father. And Jacob worked for him because he wanted to marry um, Rachel. Now, he worked seven years, and Laban promised he would give him Rachel, but Laban didn't. He tricked him, and he gave him lazy eye. I'm trying to do my eye. Lazy eye Leah. <laughs> Now, Jacob wasn't happy at all with that because he loved Rachel, and so he got tricked. But again, you go back, there was some trickery before. And so he had to work seven more years, and when he worked seven more years, he finally got Rachel. Now, Rachel had been barren, hadn't been able to have any children, whereas Leah was popping them out, right? And so Rachel already felt some type of way. If you go back in some other scriptures, she's, she's blaming Jacob, saying, hey, how come you don't tell the Lord to let me have a baby? You know, he's like, it ain't my fault. Maybe it's something you do, you know. So they're going back and forth. So she already had a chip on her shoulder before she offered a handmaid and all of that. So when she finally, finally became pregnant and she had Joseph, that was Jacob's favorite because it came from his favorite wife. It came from his love. All right? So he has a, she has a baby. That's the favorite. Well, it, it might have been okay if he had kept it a secret, but no, no, no. He constantly lavished love on Joseph. He constantly um, said things about him being his favorite. And so his other children, you know he had 11 other sons. They're upset. They're feeling some kind of way because Joseph wasn't even the oldest. He was next to the baby. So the hierarchy is it's the oldest son that gets all this stuff and then and so forth. So they were really upset with Joseph. And then Jacob made him a coat. A coat of many colors, they call it. Now, there's a lot of um, talk about the coat. They don't really know for specifically. But what I liked when I was researching, they said the coat had long sleeves. Now, if a coat had long sleeves, that meant that you didn't do any work. So, not only is Joseph dad's favorite, but you trying to tell me that Joseph don't have to do no work? He don't have to pull his weight? So that's making the brothers feel another type of way. And it says at the end of the fourth verse, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably unto him. And I talked about, when I was looking at this, I thought, not only they say the title of this lesson is when love is lost. I said, when love is lost in the house, in the house, because you expect to be hated sometimes in the world. You don't expect everybody that you meet to like you. You don't expect everybody that you meet to respect you. You don't expect everybody that you meet to even, um, want to hear what you have to say or help you get to your goals. But in the house, you expect your family. If nobody else, you expect your family to help you achieve your goals. So with that in mind, Joseph kept talking. Remember, he's 17. He's a teenager. So he doesn't understand. He wasn't able to look at those visual cues, those, those physical cues. You know when someone's talking to you? And, 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 or you're talking to someone and they're looking some type of way, you could usually read, have some discernment. Oh, they don't want, they don't want to say nothing to me or they don't like me or they don't want me to keep talking. Apparently Joseph didn't have those at that time because he kept on talking. You're going to find out in the next verses. Now I want to pause here for a second because I thought about 
Bishop and I. Bishop and I got married. We had both been married before. I had two boys. He had a daughter and a son. And then after we had been married, I think about six months or so, I had already started the paperwork to accept my nephew, my great nephew Chris, um, to come live with me. And then, of course, now that I'm married, come live with us. So they had to come back and do the interview and whatnot. So we were a blended family. And when you're a blended family, you don't have, when your kids don't have the same parents inside the house, you're a little cautious. You're a little cautious. You want to make sure that your kids get what's due them. So when we came together, we talked. And then we also had an assurance plan. And we said, if something were to happen to me, to Lori, then I want to make sure that Stevie and Michael are taken care of. And so I put them on my policy, my husband and my boys. So that 50% went to my husband, 25, 25 to my boys to make sure they would have something because I would no longer be alive to take care of them. I wasn't thinking about what their biological father may do or may not do. As a mother, my responsibility. As a father, Bishop said, well, here's 50% for you and 25 and 25 for Inez and for Joshua because I want to make sure they're taken care of. Remember, we're newly married. We, we, we praying and hoping this goes to, for the long haul, but let's be realistic. We have both been broken before, so we want to make sure that our children were taken care of. And I think about this with um, Jacob and Rachel. They want to make sure that their son, Joseph, and then Benjamin came later, are taken care of. So I, I can't fault them too much because they, that's the love for a parent but we have to be careful that we don't play favorites. Now, Bishop has said, and I have been disagreeing with him with this since we got married, he says we have favorites. And he says, Michael's your favorite. And I said, no, Michael's not. I said, I love both of my children, but I do know that there's some things that Michael has that Stevie doesn't have, and some things that Stevie has that Michael doesn't have. But I love them both. I don't, I don't play favorites. I, I truthfully do not believe I play favorite. But it may have looked that way because Michael lived here. Stevie was away in the military. So the, the relationship with Michael changed. It got closer. But it doesn't mean that I love him anymore. And what happened here is Jacob, he put enmity between the siblings because he openly, openly said that Joseph was his favorite. He gave him a gift that no one else had. Th that coat of many colors was like a royalty garment that said that your son, now remember the, the, the chain of command, Reuben was the oldest, but here's Joseph getting the coat. And so they could say, well, you, you never got me a coat. Think about that. Think about when you were little and your sibling got something that you didn't get, or maybe you were the favorite and you got something that they didn't get. How did that change your relationship with your brother or your sister? It makes it very, very difficult when someone is jealous. It makes it very, very difficult. And that jealousy can brew into bitterness and hatred. And it got to the point where they wanted to murder him. Murder him. All right. So it doesn't matter why. Jacob and Rachel, or they're speaking more of Jacob in, in this term. It doesn't matter why he um, said that Jacob was, uh, Joseph was his favorite. What it was is bad parenting. That's what it was, bad parenting. And it came from generations, and it's going to go to generations because the brothers were old. They were adults, and they were still feeling some type of way about the way they were treated. So it carried them into their adulthood. All right, let's look at the second part. It's sibling rivalry. Sibling rival rivalry, Genesis 37, 5 through 11. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren. See, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't. And they hated him yet more. And he said unto him, unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. 
For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made ambiance to my sheaf. Ambasans. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? You, you, you ain't the boss of me. <laughs> You're going to reign over us? Or shall you have domi- indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now they already hated Joseph because he was the favorite. Now you're telling them in your dream that you're going to be ruler over them? They hated him the more. Verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream. And he just thought he'd share. He told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made ambassons to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on this earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So let's go back. You have a toxic relationship in the house. None of the brothers like Joseph. But Joseph, in his innocence, in his immaturity, he wants to share with his brothers a dream that God gave him. It was innocent. He wasn't trying to make them upset. He was just trying to share, communicate. So he tells them, you know, we're in the field, and there's these sheaves of, of wheat. And so, you know, they put them in these bundles. And Joseph said, and mine is up tall in the middle and it's standing straight and yours are there around about and you're bowing over well they're like wait 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 so you're trying to say that you're going to be a ruler over us you're 17 you're next to the baby but you're telling me you're going to rule over me already daddy likes you better but you're going to rule over us so they hated him the more But then Joseph had another dream, and he told them this dream. And this time, he told them in the presence of their father. So he talked about him um, being the stars, the 11 stars represented the 11 tribes, his brothers. And the sun and the moon represented his mom and dad. And all of them were bowing to him. And his dad is like, no, wait a minute. You know, hush your mouth. You know what I think? I think Jacob was thinking about when he had the dream because Joseph got his dreaming from his daddy. Remember when he was wrestling with the spirit? Remember that back in Genesis? And and he was wrestling and God would, he would tell Jacob things. He would tell Jacob which way to go. He would tell Jacob what to do. He would tell Jacob what to say. Jacob would listen to the heavenly father. So that's why I believe it says, and Jacob pondered this. He remembered this. He knew it was going to come true because it came from God. It reminded him of itself. But he was also, his maturity, don't be telling everybody your dream. Even though they're your brothers, it doesn't mean they can handle it. How many of you, God has told you something? God has told you something and you couldn't tell nobody. You couldn't tell nobody. Because you knew that if you told someone, they would be like a dream stealer or a dream killer. They didn't want to believe you. They're not going to help you get there. Matter of fact, they might feel a little jealous that you got the dream and they didn't. So you had to keep it to yourself. And some dreams may may, uh, come to fruition quickly. Other ones may take years. And this was years. And so Joseph told them way too early way too early. And all it did was make them hate him more. Made them hate him more. So maturity and wisdom should have prevented Joseph from opening his mouth, but it did not because he was a kid. Let's look at the last part. James, oh, no, no, I want to read this. This is James. This was out of one of the daily devotionals. 
Um, you know, you have a devotion reading for each day when you're preparing for the lesson. And this was really good. It's James 4, 1 through 7. It says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. I'm James 4, 1 through 7. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. <laughs> you only want it so you can brag or show off. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Fifth verse. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When you have feelings of hatred, it's the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But the brothers, they meditated on that word. You know, when we talk about meditating on the word day and night, they meditated on hatred. They meditated on favoritism. They meditated on Joseph talking, talking, talking about what God was going to do. They meditated on that. And that's why it built to a murderous scheme. You have to make sure that you resist the devil if you want him to flee from you. So let's go to the result of hate. Section three, point three, the result of hate. This is the 37th chapter still, but we're dealing with verses 23 and 24, and then the final verse 28. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, the brothers were herdsmen, farm men, and sometimes their job was to go find green pastures. And so they would be away from home, and sometimes they would be away from home for days. So Jacob had sent Joseph to go find his brothers. And he went one spot, and they had already moved, and they told him, no, go, they've moved on to this spot. So he went and found the brothers. Now, the brothers recognized him. Dag, here comes Joseph. Here he comes. I don't want to hear his mouth today. Have you ever had a person that um, was always happy? And I'm sorry, Mr. Wilder, I thought about you. <laughs> always happy. Every time you see them, they're smiling and they're laughing and they're bubbly and they're energetic. And you know that some days it's wonderful because you feel that way and you need it. Then some days you ain't feeling happy. You're not feeling excited. You may be worried with your job, your home. It could be anything. And here comes that person. And you're like, oh, no. Here she come. Here he come. I don't want to hear that. So they saw Joseph coming. And they recognized him. And they probably, in my sanctified imagination, said something like, you know what? I'm tired of him. 
he needs to go. So they had a plot. And their plot was they were going to kill him, right? Have you read this? They were going to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, he said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in the pit. Now, Reuben planned to come back and save him later. And it wasn't because he loved Joseph. It was only because he was the oldest and the father had Joseph, Jacob had Joseph as his favorite. And Reuben thought, well, you know, if I bring, if I bring him back, that might give me some cool points with daddy. And he might, you know, I, I, I'll move up a few notches. So it wasn't out of the kindness of his heart. It, it, it was that proud spirit. And so they said, okay, we'll put him in the pit. So they put him in the pit. And I was looking up pits because they use these as wells for water. So rain would come and fill up the well and they could draw from it. And I said, I wonder how deep that pit was. They said it was 10 meters. And I compared what was 10 meters. That's like 32 and some change feet. They threw their brother in a pit. I'm sure they didn't delicately just lay him in there and, and feed the rope and help him go down. They threw him in a pit. Can you imagine falling down into a pit, narrow opening, and then a pear shape at the bottom so it could fit, you know, hold uh, water, and he falls in there. He could have broke a leg. They don't mention it. He could have broke an arm. They don't mention it. But I'm sure he got banged up and bruised up, and they left him there to die. That was what they were going to do. But before that, you know they had to disrobe him because they were already feeling uh, some type of way about him getting a coat in the first place. So they ripped the coat off of him. They violated him. They attacked him. They ripped that coat off of him. And then they put blood on it. What was the blood for? To show their daddy that his favorite is gone. The animals got him. Do you imagine that, that you go and lie to your father? You, 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 gonna, you plot to kill. You plot to kill your brother, his favorite. But you lie to your father. You tell him that your brother, an animal, attacked him. Your brother, he's gone. Do, do you think about the heartache that the father felt? to know one of his children was gone. They didn't care. They didn't care. So they were gonna leave him in the pit and then they saw some merchants coming by. And they're like, oh, hey, wait, 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 wait. Judah said, Judah, praise, huh? Judah said, we can get some money for this. Let's sell him. Human trafficking. That's what it was. So they pull him back out of the hole and they decide to sell him for 20 shekels of silver, which was the going rate at that time. I know, so sad. And they go back to, uh, now, now what, I, what, I, what I really like too also about this God, God's providential hand, it says, then there passed by Midianites that drew up and lifted Joseph, and, and they drew, not the Midianites, but the brothers, drew him up out of the pit. This is verse 28. And so Joseph to the Ishmaelites. Now remember, if you go back, 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 these are family members. These are family. He sold them to family. The brothers sold him to family, them to family. And I just love how God just takes care of his own. He takes care of his own. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Okay. So... When I thought about them, uh, I think Rosalind taught one time from the pit to the palace. Because if you read in the other books of um, Genesis 39 all the way up to 45, 46, it talks, it talks about Joseph and everything that happened to him. There was a lot of bad stuff that happened to him, but there was way more good stuff. And it just showed that his dreams came to fruition. Oh, yeah, they came to pass. And his brothers did have to bow to him. And his daddy did have to bow to him. And he was like second in command. So everything that he dreamed, he dreamt when he was 17, came to pass. But like I said, sometimes you got to hold on to your dream. You can't talk about it too quickly. 
So I added this one little uh, last bit, God works it out for good. And it made me think about what the devil meant for evil. God worked it out for my good. It says, we may not understand it or even see it, but God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. It is his plan that he will allow to manifest in his time. And I, and I thought about um, when a woman is pregnant and she has the seed of life within her. You can't tell immediately that she's pregnant. There's stuff that's happening on the inside. Her body is preparing for it. Um, her, her, her uterus is getting larger. Um, the placenta is growing. There's so much that's happening on the inside to protect and nourish and feed that baby. But you on the outside, you don't know. Sometimes even the woman doesn't know that she's pregnant. But after a time, after a time, her belly starts to grow. And not only does her belly start to grow, but she has other changes on her physical body that allow for that baby to grow and be nourished and be healthy. And then after about nine months or so, that baby comes forth. That baby started off as a seed. That baby started off as a dream. That baby started off as a, as, as a, uh, uh, um, uh, it, the word I was looking for, but a seed, a, a miracle, a, um, I was thinking of seed time and harvest, really, because I thought about the seed and the time, the time that you have, you're pregnant with the baby, and then the harvest when you're in the hospital and you're pushing that baby forward. That baby is that promise. And God has given each and every one of us a promise, each and every one of us, because we're all God's favorite. We're all God's favorite. And I love the fact that God, that Lori's no more special than Roslyn or Karen or Wilda or Elder. I'm no more special. God loves all of us. And, and, and where God is, there's no room for jealousy. Why should I be jealous of your gift when he's gave, given me a gift? Why should I try to stop you from doing what God has given you to do? God has given each and every one of us a gift, and it's our time to use it or lose it. And I say use it or lose it because you don't want, like I, I, I used this example before. I look at expiration dates. I go to the grocery store. I buy milk. And you know milk's only good for so many days. And if I don't use the milk before the due date, it expires and it's no good. I don't want to die and not have used the gifts that God put in this vessel. I don't want to expire full unused. I don't want that. You shouldn't want that. So I don't have time to think about childhood things about my father didn't want me. I can't be mad at that. I can't be like Reuben and all the other brothers who were mad about not being their, the father's favorite. They were still okay. They were still going to be taken care of. I talked to one of our mothers this morning, and she shared with me her mother died when she was three. And she said her stepmother didn't love her. She said her teacher didn't love her. Her husband at the time didn't love her, left her with four babies, didn't love her. And she said, she says, Sister Lori, do you think that you can ever forget when you weren't loved? You think you can ever forget when you were, weren't even thought of, that, 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 that people just didn't like you? Do you think you can forget that? And I said, no, mother, I don't think you can forget it. But I believe that you can become bitter or better. You can let that be your testimony of how you're not going to be to anyone else. Now that you have children, make sure all of them feel loved. You have to be very, very careful as parents what we say to our kids, how we treat our kids. You have to be very, very careful because they will grow up thinking that you didn't love them. 
because you never bought them a coat. You never had them a coat made. You never said to them that they were your favorite. Be very, very careful. We have to be accountable for how we parent. And if you've made some mistakes, self-reflection, fix it. Go apologize to your daughter, your son. Let them know, I, I am so sorry. I didn't know you felt that way. I wasn't trying to make you feel that way. I apologize for what I said. That was insensitive. Because you don't want the generations to continue like it did in this story. You don't want it to continue. We have the power of influence. And we can build up the house that we have, our children and their children. But only if you're honest and you come clean. It's okay to say I made a mistake. It's okay to tell your kids you weren't perfect. You were not perfect. I am not perfect. So I want to end with this. Even though you have a story that's difficult and causes you pain, question, how do you find hope in a story that causes you pain? God gave each and every one of us a story. And sometimes the story's not so nice. Sometimes the things that we have to go through are hard. Sometimes you're by yourself, but you gotta go through it. But this should comfort you. I wanna leave you with five promises. God's five promises for when life is hard in difficult times. Promise number one, God is always with me. I will not fear. And I believe Joseph had to have that in his heart. God is always with me. I will not fear. When he was thrown 33 feet down in that pit, God is always with me. I will not fear. Promise number two, God is always in control. I will not doubt. If God gives you a word like they used to say, you can take it to the bank. Don't doubt God. Even when circumstances look like it's not going to come to pass. Don't doubt God. He, has, he will change not. If he tells you something, it's going to be. It's going to happen. Promise number three. God is always good. So I will not despair. What's given me hope during this pandemic? God is always good. So I will not despair. What's given me hope during this quarantine? God is always good, so I will not despair. Promise number four, God is always watching. I will not falter. God is always watching over us. He's always there to lead us and guide us. God is always there. You may stumble, but he can pick you up and help you get back on your path. He will order your steps. God is always watching, I will not falter. And finally, God is always victorious, I will not fail. Amen, amen, God bless you. Elder, do you wanna add something to the lesson? Amen, amen. I always wanna hear from our elders. They always have some little nuggets. Thank you, First Lady, and to uh, our Sunday School. I just want to mention um, there is something in the very first verse of our lesson, and uh, the B part of that lesson that you just mentioned. And Joseph told his father, what his wild sons yeah. Yeah. were saying. Uh -huh. Watch this. Joseph, he heard them say something yeah. Yeah. and he went and told his father. But notice something. His father never responded. You see that? His father never 
respond it. And 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 and, and Bella, that, that one of his wives, she had two sons. One was named Dan and Nepta. And the other wife, her son was named Gad and Asher. You remember that in the book of Genesis. Gad and Asher. And these four men that Joseph was heard that was bad mouthing somebody. Uh-huh. And, and, and so he went and told his father, and his father never responded. Did you ever wonder why? Yeah, yeah. Why, why didn't he respond? And I kept searching the scripture, so this is what I found. That these men, these men were in the covenant of Abraham, but they were not of the covenant of Abraham. So Jacob kept his mouth shut. He said, out of these men, man, you can expect that. Because they were not under the covenant of Abraham. Mm-hmm. That's good, that's good. So sometimes, sometimes, it's better to keep. Right. You know what I'm saying. Right. <laughs> Didn't I tell you? Our elders have those juicy nuggets that wisdom. Thank you, Elder Hinton, for that. Thank you so much. Father God, we bless you. We thank you, O God, for this word. We ask that you would help us to meditate on this word day and night, O God. We thank you for this opportunity to teach. We just thank you for being so good. Continue to bless us and keep us, and we will see everyone at 10 a.m. We will be having communion. So I love you, and see you soon.